the flickering light of Asia, or the Assyrian nation and church. The orthodoxy of the Nestorians on the doctrine of the Trinity not being in dispute, we will now explain their belief in the nature and the person of Christ, which demands our special attention. It should be remembered, however, that the whole Nestorian Christology has always centered in one sentence only which is the formula of their belief to wit. Two natures, two kunuma, and one parsopa, that is, each nature of Christ having one kunuma, but two natures and two kunum constitute but one parsopa. Now what does this formula mean? Our main difficulty is with the term kunuma, for there is no equivalent for the word either in Greek or in English. And for this reason, it was repeatedly said by the opponents of Nestorius that there is no kanuma in our Greek language. Hence, they understood it to mean nothing else but person, in the sense in which they themselves employed it, or so they are quoted by Barsoro, saying, There is no distinction between kanuma and person, parsopa, in the Greek language. The term kanuma is traceable to two roots in Syriac one, of which kanam, which has an equivalent in Arabic, kanama from which the infinitive technim is informed and in Arabic means to represent in the attributes of a personal being or personify, not however in the sense of shahasa which is equivalent to man or person. The meaning of this root in Syriac is somehow doubtful. The other root is kanam, equivalent to Hebrew, kom, and primarily in Syriac, to stand up or stand with, while in pale form, kaim, means to cause to rise, to cause to stand, to establish. Either route might be preferred, but the latter is more in harmony with the definition given by Barsarog and Hassan Bar Balawa, the two Syriac lexicographers. Quoting Barsarog, Kanuma is that which is inseparable from its nature, and that single something Makaimuta. United with the nature is a single Makaimuta, by virtue of which the knowledge of the ego in man finds expression. Kanuma rises from and stands with the nature, as Kanum in Christ represents his nature, so also Parsopa represents both Kanum and nature. For Parsopa is the tower, or center, of all human sensibility, and some of a complete nature. Further, the use of the term in the Syriac grammar may throw some more light upon the subject. All nouns which are called proper in English are called Kanume in Syriac, or Kanumal nouns. The grammatical significance of a Kanumal noun is that it is distinguishable from everything else. Nothing can be like it, and nothing can be co-founded with it. Its distinguishability belongs to it, it stands by it, it is inherent in it. Or if we quote a grammatical definition, the kanumal noun signifies that which individually and alone can be distinguished from anything else. The term is also used by the Nestorians from the three hypostases in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are the three kanum subsisting in one essence, co-equal and it's self-existent. They are spoken of as indistinguishable. They are spoken of as indistinguishable in their essence. For they are co-equal in the essential propriety, or deleta, which belongs to all the three kanum in general. But they are distinguishable in the relation of their persons to the general essence of the trinity. The deleta, or propriety, of the general essence is spirit, eternity, nature, divinity, sovereignty, judgment, authority, infinity, creation which belongs to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But the kanumal relation of the persons to the Godhead is peculiar to each according to the Holy Scriptures. For by the kanumal relation, the deleta or propriety of the Father is begetter, that of the Son is begotten, and that of the Holy Spirit is proceeding. The begetter and begotten and the proceeding each denote a kanumal distinction. By virtue overactive deleta or propriety, the three kanum are distinguished without dividing the general essence which belongs to all the three. Hence God the Father and God the Son, the Word and God the Holy Ghost, one substance, one God, and three co-equal kanum. Accordingly, what the Nestorians mean by using the term kanuma for three hypostases in the Trinity is that while all three constitute one, in whose essential substance there is no numerical distinctness, yet there are three who by virtue of their kanum are relatively distinguished, and as such are conscious of their relation to the Godhead. For without this kanumal conscious, the idea of the three relatively distinct and contemporaneous hypostases in the Godhead would be inconceivable. Hence what a kanuma implies in the Nestorian theology is a kasi personality by nature and substance, one indistinct from the general essence, 
but by its kunumal relation, distinguishable and conscious of its kunumal delata or propriety. Having thus looked over the significance and the use of the term, we shall now proceed the study of its application and doctrine of the person of Christ, which is embodied in the formula already mentioned, two natures, two kunum, and one parsopa in the extracts given above. The divinity and humanity of Christ are most clearly and are most emphatically put forth, and no better language could they be disclosed than in the clauses such as, One is the Messiah adored by all in two natures who as touching his Godhead is begotten of the Father without beginning and before all ages, and as touching his manhood was born of Mary in the fullness of time, a body of union, again behold him who is clothed with light, wrapped in swaddling bands, what a mystery is here. No less wonderful is it that he who is seated on the throne of heaven should have been laid in a manger. The ancient of times become a son of Mary in the latter times and appeared as the father, lord, and master of the sons of Adam. Now this who was born of Mary and wrapped up in swaddling bands is the son of the glorious essence of the father, the second kanuma in the trinity. He is represented not as being distinct in substance from the father or as an emanation, of the eternal divinity, but one incapable of separation and essence from the Supreme One. For as the reasonable soul has a threefold energy, mind, word, and life, and is one and not three, even so should we conceive of the three in one and one in three. Yet he is the Son who, although co-equal with the Father in substance, is distinct from the Father as the second kanuma. The sonship of the Son is essence belongs to the indivisible substance but in kanumal relation is the delata or the propriety of the begotten. Thus, by virtue of his kanuma, the second person is distinguished from the other person in the Trinity and by virtue of his quasi personality. He himself is conscious of the relation he is holding to the Father as the Son. The perfect humanity of the Son is also with equal distinctness emphasized in the Nestorian theology. The author of the Chamiz says, He was born in the womb according to the laws and peculiarities of nature, and was brought forth by his mother through the pangs of labor. Just as the divinity of the second person is one and co-equal with the essence of the Father, so his humanity is one and the same of that as his mother. The clear truth was manifested by the Son of God to his affiance church, when it pleased him in his love to come into the world, to teach and to preach the doctrine of his divinity and humanity. Again, he was in the womb for nine months and was born as a man. He being truly man, indeed the perfect divinity and perfect humanity of Christ, are both too plainly taught to require any further remarks. How are we going now to account for the formula of the two natures and two kanum? We have already seen that what the Nestorians mean by a kanuma as appeal to the three persons of the Trinity, and a Kasi personality, by nature of which each person is conscious of his relation to the Father. But if kanuma, according to Barsarog, represents a nature, how are we going to account for the two natures of Christ without admitting two kanuma in him? And if kanuma, as we rightly infer from the foregoing extracts, involves the idea of self-consciousness inherent in a personal being, how could Christ be conscious of his divinity and humanity without divine and human kanum? Further, according to the historian theology, the existence of a nature without a kanuma is inconceivable. Every nature must have a kanuma in order to subsist and without which it cannot subsist for kanuma, argues Mar Odishu, is the first essence or principle which betokens the reality of the existence of the general essence, now admitting, as we do, that Christ was a perfect God and a perfect man. How could the two natures subsist without the two principles which betoken the reality of their existence? Christ, although possessing one persopa, as the formula declares, must have certainly been conscious of the existence of the two natures. He had that divine consciousness by virtue of which he knew that he was the pre-incarnate Logos, and there was in him that human consciousness which made the Logos know that he was Jesus. It is admitted that they acted in unity, but this unity is still of two consciousnesses and not one in its nature. It is true that it is a divine human, but it is true that it is an infinite finite. For the divine nature and kanuma argues Marodishu, 
before and, before and after the union is an eternal and uncompounded spirit, but the human nature and kanuma is a temporal and compound body. Now if the union destroys the attributes which distinguishes the nature and kanuma in Christ, either the one or the other of these becomes a non-entity, or they become a thing which is neither God nor man, or they become a thing which is neither God nor man. But if the union does not destroy the attributes which distinguish the natures and kanum in Christ, then Christ must exist in two natures and two kanum, which are united in the persopa of the sonship. Thus, the unity does not exclude two distinct sources, and one persopa does not do away with the fact that there were two kanum indispensable for the completion of the two natures, of both of which Christ was himself conscious, although they constitute indeed, as it is acknowledged, but one persopa which we call atheanthropic personality. Further, if there be left any suspicion as to the plurality of persons on account of the Nestorian formula of the two kanum, or perhaps on account of the language by which their belief is expressed, such a suspicion is entirely repudiated, not only by the loud declaration of one parsopa, but also by the strongest protest against such a notion. Thus, there is plurality in the natures, but they subsist in one in their deleata, or proprieties, subsisting in one parsopa, or filiation. Again, the spiritual essences who dwell in the regions of the spirit, enraptured and the earthly, and such as were in graves rejoice, saying, He is one to all generations, and again, from these things let us rest assured that the Messiah is one in two natures and two kanum, subsisting in one parsopa affiliation, since the natures did not commingle. And in like manner we believe of the kanum, the son of the father clothed himself with him of Mary, and was conceived in womb. But let no man flinch a word from this, and willfully pervert it by specious philosophy, so as to conclude that there are two sons. For there is one son only, not a son and a son making two, but one son, we repeat, as is most proper to maintain. Now Nestorianism has been charged with teaching two parsopal natures in Christ, from which the logical inference follows that he must have had two souls. There is no ground whatever for the charge except the denial of the expression Mariam Yaldeth Olaha, Mary the Mother of God. It is necessary to recall that the Nestorian position was a polemic one against both docetic and humanitarian heresies. From the point of view of the latter heresy, Mary was the mother of Jesus because he possessed no divinity. According to Docetism, to which Cyril had made a near approach, she was the mother of God because Christ was exclusively divine. But Nestorianism, in order to refute the existing errors, held that Mary was Yildath Mashiha, or Christotokas, for in Christ God and man had met and united, and as such he was a complete man as well as a complete God, and a complete God as well as a complete man. To prove this, they undertook to refer to the instances in the life of our Lord, not by any means to show that he had two parsopal natures, such as required two distinct souls, but that the two natures were revealed distinctly enough to prove that they did exist in him. Thus there is God demanding of the tomb to yield its dead, and keeping under his control the forces of nature which he created. And there is man eating, weeping, in need of rest and sleep. He healed the sick and infirm, cleansed the lepers, and gave sight to the blind. He being truly God, he went out to the mountain to pray, and continued in prayer until dawn. He being truly man, he gave the power of walking to the lame and members to the maimed. He slept on board the ship, he being truly God, he being truly man. He revealed the secrets of a woman and told her all of her sudden and open actions, he being truly God. He wept and shed tears for Lazarus, and inquired for the place of his grave, he being truly man. The fact that each nature was present at action of the other does not disprove the unquestionable manifestation of either. The compactness of the natures, and it is admitted by the Nestorians, did not and could not conceal the distinctive evidence that Christ was both a complete God and a complete man. Our belief from the Nestorian point of view in the incarnate Logos is not arbitrarily imposed, nor has a man been deluded to embrace and to confess a belief which has not been proved itself to be scriptural.
we know that Christ was both God and man only by what he really was, that is, he exercised the functions of the visible and invisible beings. He showed himself to be the Logos distinctly enough for us to know that he was very God, and yet he ran a career which proved beyond any doubt that he was a man and son of man. Mary then was Yildeth Mashiach, or Christotokos, in whom Jesus and the Logos united and constituted one Parsopa, a distinct duality with a constituted unity. How this union was formed the Nestorians do not undertake to explain. To them he is an incomprehensible mystery. The descent of the world is inexplicable, and is beyond the examination of all inquirers, and the union so exalted that no words can express it. Again, hitherto the law of nature was in fort was in force but in the appearance of a savior from a virgin the law of birth from conjugal was abrogated and the mind that would comprehend how this was must lose itself in the inquiry but that the union of the two natures in one person or parsopa of christ is indissoluble is equally made plain thus says the author of the hudra the natures and kanum subsist in one parsopa of this one filiation and as there are in the godhead three kanum one self-existent, so the filiation of the Son is of two natures, two kanum and one parsopa. Therefore, Lord, we worship thy divinity and thy humanity, without dividing them, for the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is one. The sovereignty is one, the will is one, and the glory is one. Again says the author of Chamis, The life-giving spirit was the agent in his pure conception, and gave a body of members to the infant by the power of God and joined it to him in one imitable personal dignity, not to be changed forever and ever. Thus, by adopting of two natures, two kanum, and one parsopa, the Nestorians have fortified their theology against the two heresies, which co-founded the divine and human natures in Christ, and consequently destroyed the very foundation of the autonomous. At the same time, avoid any possible inference of two distinct personalities by uniting the two kanum in one indissoluble parsopal dignity. Seeing that we confess but one Son, one Christ, one Parsopa, we have no fear of being guilty of blasphemy.